that on its own. Curious to see how sharing a screen from your browser to share your browser is going to work. Uh, you can only share. Do I need to give you like uh, some special privileges? Maybe? I don't think so. I know. That's perfect. Yep, came across. See it. Yep. OK. A couple screens going. And yeah, that looks very good. So I think I think we can we can start. So welcome everyone. Sorry for for the late notice, but I see some people showed up. So it's, and thanks a lot, uh, Jeff, for for uh, for uh, stepping in and and give us giving us uh, an overview on this topic. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you're at. Um, I'm Jeff Salins. Um, I work in the um, CNF working group as one of the co-chairs right now underneath the CNCF umbrella. So I work with um, my friend Taylor and uh, Ian Wells on, on around like we're really focused on kind of the network device inside of containers kind of paradigm. But we typically work with service providers and what you'll find is that most service providers um, run air gapped environments. Um, and there's lots and lots of reasons for why they have to do this. Um, you know, typically, you know, you want some type of network segmentation when you're hosting the internet, um, you want to keep your private stuff private. And so typically, you know, there's maybe at best a proxy, sometimes not even that. And it's for, you know, your typical security compliance reasons, right? So it's not just the whole walled perimeter, but, you know, the era of potentially pulling up um, a malicious image through you know, a public repo, you run a Helm chart and suddenly something spins up that you don't want to spin up and it tries to phone home. If there's a default proxy set up, you can get yourself into trouble really, really fast. So at my previous um, job, I was at Charter Communications as one of our lead um, architects for our container as a service platform. We set out to build a fully air gapped container as a service platform. and um, we had quite a few bumps and bruises along the way. Um, you find out that like getting something truly air gapped, especially in the world of cloud, where it just assumes that you know you can egress out of your VPC or you can egress out of your data center and go to you know Red Hat or VMware or you know whoever's repos, whoever your favorite software developer is. There's just this notion that maybe there's Docker Hub floating around there somewhere and that you're always going to have access to it. Then suddenly you don't. Um, and so how do you develop and you know run the images that you want but then build a pipeline that then assumes that you are going to then not have any access whatsoever to the internet and so this is just kind of a very high level overview um, of what we were building so the other big thing right is you know you got to start with an internal repository um, it could be any of the favorite ones you know it could be artifactory it could be harbor be homegrown. Um, but one of the biggest things that you have to instantly, you know, get all the people who want to move fast to um, not do is to basically just turn that into a proxy. So most of the private repositories have the ability to where all it does is like an intermediate stopgap where it's just going anytime you make a request, it goes to the uh, public repository and immediately pulls it down. So if you put don't put the right restrictions in place, um, and I know typically the word restriction isn't really liked in the um, the cloud native world because everybody wants to be agile and move fast and get things on demand. But um, we found that it actually saved us a lot of pain by um, controlling what releases um, were made, you know, available to this far right cloud infrastructure, both you know um, vendor provided images, uh, open source provided images, and then privately developed images. And so first thing we had to do was build a, a dev environment that was actually truly air gapped. And um, the struggle with that is, is, you know, people will turn up proxies in their dev environment. They do things and you will find lots and lots of rando things that slip through the cracks. So depending on what you're using to deploy Kubernetes and to, um, you know, what images you're hosting, you will find that like in, you know, your ranchers, your Tanzus, your open shifts, um, even a lot of homegrown cube ADM or cube spray deployments and stuff. There are hidden curl commands everywhere. There is assumptions that packages are available. Um, there is 
some automated life cycle that you know just assumes you know certain um, containers or service platforms will just go and self update and you'll go you'll build something in an air de gap deployment like once and maybe you did get all of the packages that you need but then suddenly it goes into production and the first time you try to um, update you know your fluent D um, pods to like you know as you're doing like your logging you're like oh I'm going to update this log folder and suddenly everything breaks because there was this assumption with this hidden URL inside of the tooling that it was going to go back to you know Rancher or Tanzu's main repositories and pull down the most updated certified image that they had. So you find all these weird little nuances um, as you build it out because there's tons and tons of expectancies within you know the Ansible or the Go or whatever is written that there's going to be access to these. And you really don't find these things until you get things first built in a truly air gap environment in dev. And then once you start doing all the day two operations in production. Um, trying to think, I'm just kind of rambling here. Like what, what specific questions do people have around like how you would build an air gap deployment um, or, you know, maybe like what pain points come about it and stuff like that. Okay. Feel free to jump in. I see Alex, you have your mic open. Yep. Um... I'm just wondering whether um, in this the developers themselves are also air gapped, or whether the cloud inf uh, the, the infrastructure that you're building is um, air gapped. So we it it was a um, an iterative approach. We eventually got it to where the development teams were air gapped as well, and what we would do it um. It started off and like it instantly makes things start to slow down, which then annoys the developers. But when we got the private repositories actually tuned correctly, so that way um, you could pull in an image on demand to the internal repository and then immediately execute like a sanity scan and then tag it so that it was made available in one of the dev sandbox environments. So once, and it took a long time to get all of the web hooks set up to create all of the filters to make sure like, I mean, originally we were pulling in like the whole Helm repo, right? Like just the stream Helm repo. And suddenly you start going through everything and there's like, you know, here's a, a chart for deploying Bitcoin miners. <laughs> and we're like, mm -hmm. oh, we probably don't want this available in our data centers, right? So we started to build the filters. Um, it took a lot. I mean, it's like most automation tasks. There was a lot of pain and effort up front. And then once we kind of got to the top of that, you know, hockey stick curve, we fell over the other side. And so... It started um, with, you know, developers just kind of doing whatever they wanted, which, you know, um, it's just because they're trying to get stuff done. And then they would try to go and deploy in the RGAP environment and everything would break. Um, we'd go collect all the lessons learned, like why isn't this working? You know, like which URLs did we not catch in this chart or this manifest? Um, you know, sometimes the containers themselves think that they can reach out to the internet. So, you know, you spin up the image and then within the automation, within the container itself, especially if you're building runners and stuff, you'll find like all kinds of stuff baked into a runner that suddenly just pukes on itself when you try to do this in an air gapped world. Um, so that was iteration one is, you know, they're building locally, they put it into dev, everything breaks, we do some analysis. Um, then we got it to where we were, you know, creating the taboo of where we made it to where you would make a request to the private registry and then it would just automatically pull something down um do the thing but then there was no filters in place there was no sanity checks so like you know it would just go to a url and would pull everything at that url it's not being choosy and then once again you start getting like the bitcoin riders and things like that that come in and expose you to risk um and so then finally you know we got it to where we had like you know the appropriate repos mapped out and um the other thing too is you know i'm assuming since it's a cncf i'm being very like you know Kubernetes and container focus, but we had to do this for everything, right? So like the base OS image, um, you have to create your image and then all of the tools that are building that image, we only let them pull from the private repositories. So all of the packages, you know, whether it's yum or whether it's, um, you know, Debian based, um, we're sitting there vetting all these packages, putting them into the repository, then building the images. And honestly, once we went all the way to the left in the build process and thought about what do we actually need to build. Um, we then started to write all the webhooks to you know, pull everything from upstream. 
immediately do the scan and then tag it and make it available for dev. And then eventually what we did was um, the devs would just build within the dev environment or locally, but they would point you know, their local devices to the internal repositories instead when they were doing specific repositories. And then if the package wasn't there, we'd make a note of it, we'd go, we'd get it for them. Um, we, and they could now do this through self-service, but hmm. the framework was already there in place so that they know that they're not gonna pull anything malicious, um, that it's gonna be you know, tagged appropriately. Like, so like I said, once you get that automation in place, um, then the devs are allowed to kind of do what they want while also still meeting like what, you know, production and operations are demanding from a security and a compliance standpoint. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, mirrors a lot of what I think we've done at GV Search. Um, the uh, question that I have is whether the developers who are working on their developer box there, uh, do they have just free access to the internet to like go and look up things on Google? Um, yeah, I mean, on their local devices, we're not getting in their way because this is where you get into like the weird chicken, the egg scenario, right? Is what packages do you need to pull? Um, so, well, and that's, that's the thing that I think I find crazy at G research where developers don't like that developer box is also air gapped and mm -hmm. they don't actually have access to the internet and to get to even understand like what they need. I don't, I don't know how they no <laughs> sometimes like you want a hugging model you got to go out to the internet and figure out which one you want and then to get that inside there isn't a proxy yet uh, anyway that I've... yeah no that um that's definitely not like because yeah you get into scenarios like how do you know what you need to add to your private repo how do you develop how do you pull in tools if you know at some point there has to be some level of freedom so you know what you want to test in the first place right um yeah and so Basically, and when, when you say developer coming from like the service provider world, I mean, there's like somewhere upwards of seven to eight lines of business with, you know, four to five development teams each that was then all funneling into this big, big infrastructure, right? So like, basically what we did is if it was heading for in production, right? It was going to one of our, um, our public cloud, you know, um, areas, or sorry, environments or one of our data centers, there's basically like this inlet that starts with, are you building on one of the golden images? Are the packages that you need available? Um, and so, you know, we provide that base template and we we would start giving out tips, right? For like the developers who are building locally, be like, look, you spin up this, you know, in virtual box on your machine, start with this image. So then you can see, are all the packages as you're developing and you have free reign with the internet, you know, are the packages that you need within this Ubuntu, you know, um, box or within this red hat box are they available if the answer is no run yum update you know add the repos that you need and then we'll check it make sure that's safe and then once you get into the you know the true pipeline towards production and you move through dev you'll find out quickly whether or not you built your stuff correctly because it'll break in the dev environment with little risk to you right like dev is we treat it truly as dev if stuff breaks that's okay um but it's not going to let you build anything that you did not seed in that private repo. So like, you know, it's on the developer to kind of keep track of what may not be available for them. And then, you know, they need to run the diffs to find out, you know, where are they going to fall on their face? And sometimes they don't know. And that's why we have the dev environment is, you know, they build it locally in the box. Okay, go deploy this in dev, um, see what breaks. And then, you know, typically it'll break two or three times before they catch everything, you know, just because they've pulled something and, you know, the amount of code they're writing themselves versus stuff that they've just pulled from other places, you know, is sometimes very drastically way more towards the, I wrote a little bit of glue code for like lots and lots of other people's stuff. And then that's when you have all those embedded URLs that get you in trouble. And there's just this assumption that, you know, your VPC is pointing out to whatever public repository and it can pull whenever it wants to. What are all the checks that you're running? Uh, you know, what, we run a battery of tests ourselves. I'm just curious what um, particularly third party uh, tools you're employing to do all that stuff. So now since I'm, you know, I just moved companies, um, I'm not running any tools currently. Uh, I'm, uh, sorry, doing, yeah. But like uh, at the old one, I mean, you know, it, it depends like a bunch of your, you know, standard um, security scanning tools. Um, so like, 
image scanning tools, code scanning tools, you know, Veracode, um, X-Ray, if it was in Artifactory or Prisma Cloud. I mean, a lot of the big players. Um, and we run different kinds of scans and different types of compliance checks. Then we'd also have like a battery of functional tests, right? So for instance, I mean, we treated the infrastructure the same as we did the application. So like we would have this whole um, battery of tests to make sure that all of the packages we needed to build Kubernetes existed, for instance, and that the packages that we were putting together would survive like Sonobuoy that would survive, um, you know, we would use disaster recovery methodologies where we'd, you know, back up etcd, we'd completely nuke the cluster, rebuild from the cluster. And like, so, I mean, we, we treated everything from top to bottom, like, you know, this whole like top left-hand corner here, the whole GitOps thing, I mean, I'm not going to say we were even 80% there, but that was what we were ultimately striving for. And so whether it was, you know, um, all I'm doing is updating, um, you know, um, like cube ADM, for instance, right? Or I'm updating cube proxy. Uh, I'm updating, like I said, a Fluentd thing, the application itself. I'm making um, an update to the base operating system. Every single one of those was declared in Ansible. And Ansible was sitting there creating a mapping. And you can do this with any, you know, pick your favorite scripting modeling language of choice. But um, basically what we would do is we would make, you know, these infrastructures code templates to the best of our ability then put the Kubernetes manifest on top of that with the Helm charts and so we'd build like this layered stack and everything line by line, you know, would map only to an internal repository. And then, like I said, where we would constantly think we were good is, you know, we've used Rancher, we'd used Tanzu, we used OpenShift in the past and stuff is, you know, our manifest would be clean, like the YAML driving Ansible or the YAML that we were pushing into Kubernetes, everything pointed to an internal repository. But then there's, some internal mechanism within Tanzu, for instance, that thinks it can go back to VMware or, you know, OpenShift is assuming that the satellite instance has access to the internet. And that is always when we found all of the gotchas as we were trying to do this or at the application layer itself is when everything would break because the app would assume that it had access to the internet. And we're like, you don't get that. Yeah, and in a couple of cases, I mean, I run a, an open source program office, so in a couple of cases, we've had to go back to whatever uh, project it is and try and fix their stuff so that it doesn't phone home or there is an option for looking at an internal uh, repository or um, uh, you know some file somewhere kind of thing. Um, occasionally, we've actually run into places where people didn't want to to fix the stuff mm -hmm. um have you ever run into that kind of situation where yeah in fact it um especially too like so in the service provider world because we have you know slas and slos that we're required to keep we um you know we walk a fine line with open source and also wanting you know if we can get it some type of vendor supported um backing for you know even open source projects i mean that's how like you know the red hats of the world make their money for instance right is provide you know service agreements on open source software um so yeah it, it gets weird um and it was a lot of times i'll be honest being at like you know a tier one um, telecommunications company makes it a lot easier to wave a big stick and say i need you to fix this for me or i'll go to your competitor um but we we run into this a lot or conversely um we would go in like what we did with our containers of service platform at the platform layers. We had to go in with a fine tooth comb and we went and changed a bunch of manifests um, ourselves internally and just swapped out all the URLs to point to our internal repositories. And this is, like I said, I mean, we were six, seven months in, you know, we're like, we're good. And then suddenly we would like run like one update or something. And next thing you know, we found like this other hidden embedded thing that would break everything. Um, and, you know, some of that, like, that's the whole being agile thing is sometimes you just got to take your lumps and deal with like, you know, bruises that come along the way. But what we would find sometimes is like certain, um, you know, open source communities or vendors would be like, well, you changed this, so we're not going to support you. And we're like, well, then I can't use your software. Like it, it, that is definitely like a struggle. Right. And so, I mean, the, um, with like the more sane ones, we were, you know, we even got them to start making it so that some of these things were modular. So like it would actually like guide you into like adding the repositories that you would potentially pull through. 
Um, you know, others gave us the full Heisman Trophy stiff arm and told us, you know, if you do this, you're out of compliance. Um, and then most were somewhere in the middle, right? Where like they grudgingly, slowly, but surely. But like I said, that was with me wielding, you know, my company's name behind me and being like, I'll go to this other, you know, competitor or, I mean, even in the open source world, right? Like, I mean, how many different log forwarders are they are? And, you know, everybody's convinced there's the best. I'm like, hey, I'll, I'll right. switch from FluentD to Logstash if you guys are going to be jerks, you know, like, and like they're, they still, you know, they, they want their babies to succeed. So even in the open source, there's some level of, um, you know, protection and willingness to try to like, you know, make your software projects stand above the rest. So, I mean, we definitely kind of leverage that a little bit. Um, it's definitely harder, you know, if you're like an eight man startup and your lead devs like, Hey, I have to do this because of this. And they're like, yeah, we don't care about you. That That's definitely going to be a much bigger challenge. Yeah. It's, um, you know, we, we've been mostly successful except where the people we're trying to convince are so big. They, just decided to ignore us. There's Google and Amazon come to mind. Um, mm -hmm. The AWS one that comes to mind currently is something in the client that they don't actually follow the HTTP standards for redirection. Yep. And we point this out to them and they're just like, yeah, we're not going to fix that. I'm like, but it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yep. what are you going to do? Oh, well, well, even then, too, you have to decide where your line, like, so the Amazon example, right? If you're using um, EKS's CNI, it's um, it's a routable IP address throughout your VPC, right? So, like, you really have to, like, understand, too, and I come from, like, a networking background, so the legacy model of security of, I, you know, I think of things in, like, perimeters and, like, you know, you know, here's this walled garden, here's this wall. Well, you have to understand like where your walled garden is too, or, um, you know, same thing with, um, you're doing something fancy with like Calico or Cilium even where you're advertising pod IP space to the underlay via BGP. Um, you might provide reach to something you never intended to provide reach. And so this is where, you know, like I said, um, getting your dev, your pre-prod and your prod environments truly air gapped and getting like, you know, it's it's impossible to get 100% efficacy, obviously, between your different environments. And you don't want to, too, because there's certain things you want to do with one and the other. But on the networking piece, like, if you say that your prod is truly air-gapped, right? Like, I think um, someone, I think, Ricardo, you said at the beginning that a lot of people in this group, you know, work in, like, you know, the, the yeah. education space, like, at universities or, like, research and stuff. So, I mean, like, you know, I'm assuming, like, CERN, you know, like they probably like don't even have a fiber line running to anything that like, so there's no risk of it. Right. I mean, if, so, if you are going to do that, then you need to make sure that your dev environment is going to do it or else you're going to break things in production. So maybe I have a follow up on this and it's, uh, it's actually more on the, on how much you expose the fact that these environments are air gapped to the developers themselves. And I'll give an example. So, yeah. The CERN is probably a good example because there are systems that are clearly air gapped. Anything that is controlling the machines or or the accelerator is 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 very much uh, controlled. But then you want to give developers a good experience, and they have a general network where they can actually get uh, internet connectivity and do their builds and things like this. So uh, imagine uh, like one situation would be you do your, all your work, all your builds, all your images in some sort of general network, and then through this process that you also described of kind of uh, um, approving images, uh, you would have uh, some sort of replication of say the re uh, registry in, in the air gapped environment with some sort of automated replication. And this would be like an exception to the air gap is that you actually have some path for the images to be promoted to, to be exposed in an air gapped env environment. How this works could be uh, done in different ways, but let's say, for example, you will have two hardware instances, one in a general network, another one in a air gap network, and you would control the, what gets replicated automatically. Uh, but then the, the question here is if you would have deployments both in multiple air gap environments and you're running uh, instances of a registry in each of these air gap environments, how much do you hide this from the applications and from the developers? Because there are some things you can do, like uh, for example, have uh, mutating webhooks that will just rewrite the registry to use a local registry, things like this. 
how far do you go into making this uh, invisible to, to the to the service managers, the, uh, developers, etc.? Um, so the answer is, is it depends, which I know is a cop out, but I'll explain. Because um, for one, there's um, there's lots of ways to solve this error gap, right? So I, I definitely don't want to propose solutions just because depending on your environment. I mean, one proposed solution is. I take a thumb drive and I walk to all the different environments and I plug it in and I upload it to the registry. Um, but you know what you were saying about having multiple. So what we actually did was um, we had a private network, and since I was in a networking company, we had the ability to do this. But we had a source registry that was the single source of truth for everybody, um, and we then had a bunch of satellites in different environments um, where they would have a private connection to the source registry, but then other than that, they were only accessible to that local environment. And then we had a mirroring strategy. Um, and so what this afforded us was since we had a single source of truth where we basically had a single um, instance to write, but you couldn't read from it because we didn't want to overtax the thing that was like you know our master source of truth. And then everyone else was a read in its local environment um, and was only accessible there. But then your your point about you know mutating webhooks is basically then I could take an image and deploy it anywhere. And there was just this assumption that there was a local registry within that local network. And you were always, since it was a single source of truth with a common tag that's then mirrored to all the different satellites, um, it doesn't matter where your software is deploying because you get to, and this is something, this, I mean, and this took us like 18 months to get to, so I don't wanna make it sound like it's trivial. Um, but basically it got to the point where like a developer would write one image um, you know, that they would then push upstream into that source of truth. And that one image got to make the assumption that it was gonna call you know, a local URL. And since they're private networks, um, you know, we leverage things like any cast addresses on the networking side. And then we you know, um, got a little bit you know, um, loose with um, some of our um, URL naming because you know, these were all in isolated environments, you know, depending on which data center you're in and stuff. And then we would control in our route tables what networks were and weren't exposed. And so then, you know, your software deploys in any of our different data centers or any of our different VPCs or other public cloud instances. And it was always assuming that the registry was local to that network and it was common. So then um, you have, you know, federated images and federated, you know, secure packages in these air gapped environments. Um, but then, like I said, I mean, the other way to do it is like you could do a thumb drive, like you could make it so that all of the local networks are calling back to a single source of truth. Like you could have a single um, registry and then they have, you know, two different network attachments. One's a private network to the registry and everyone calls back through that. So like we said, I'm, depending on like what your environment looks like, there's a lot of different ways to skin this cat. But um, the biggest thing that we pushed and it, you know, was the most painful was um, A, the application specifically and whether that's, you know, platform software, user applications, you know, it doesn't matter, but like your application needs to deploy in a world where there's no internet, um, right? Like, and then additionally, um, everybody needs to use the same source of truth because one of the ways, like the other part I didn't get it super deep into was, um, was how we tag things. So like I said, you're a developer, you want to, you pull a new image, like I said, and so local developer devices, not air gapped, right? Like you can do whatever you want, right? It's your device, you break it, you fix it, you rebuild, you go. Um, but the shared dev environment, right? Definitely still allowed to break things there, but we're hoping that you did your due diligence. So then you pull those images into the source of truth. But the first thing, as far as like our promotion status is, is um, the tag first makes it available only to the dev environment. So now you have the satellites in those air gap dev environments. And this tag says that, you know, only these users, um, basically what we try to get to is, um, you know, policy is code, it's kind of a buzzword, but, um, you know, using like different policy engines and whatnot, we just made it so the devs could pull images in as they wanted. Um, the policy would say, you know, you can't promote this image to these, you know, dev repos until the scans have been done, until the tests have been run. If those are successful, you're good. But once we got the policy in place and overcame that um, automation hurdle, we basically just kind of took the reins off and let the developers go because the, you know, left and right limits were in place to where they could move as fast, you know, as they wanted, but then they still weren't going to like, you know, do something that was going to take everybody else down. Yeah, no, that, that kind of matches the 
approach we try to do as well. Although probably we, we don't do it at the lower level, low level networking. Uh, we really um, need tools that are able to do these mutations. And, and this could be like for the, the, the registry and the images is the, the easiest example to just mutate the, the source, like you said. And there, there is support in quite a lot of tooling handling containerized uh, deployments to, to do this sort of thing. It's not only Kubernetes, there's other tools that also support this. But uh, yeah, I think what, one of the things that made this uh, popular is, is that we can manage this ourselves centrally without the developers having to know anything about this. And it's all handled by the deployment. So that, that's a key thing, otherwise they you get a lot of shouting. Yeah. Yeah, the developers had a lot more insight early on because things were breaking and making the mad. And they're like, hey, what's going on? Like, I'm just going to like fix this. Um, but once we kind of hit like that 18 month to almost two year mark, we just kind of, like I said, fell over the other side of the hill. The policy was in place. There was clean methods to pull new images into the private registry, validate that they were safe. And like then, like you said, after that, um, I mean, some developers, just because they would be provided baseline templates for like, you know, their container images for their OS images, et cetera, or we would just, once the base images had the URLs pre-baked in for them, at least for internal development, like you pull in third-party software, then there's always going to be some kind of deconfliction. Um, so, but yeah, we, we were able to make it to where it was largely abstracted from them. And like, once we stopped making things painful for them, they stopped asking us questions and they just did their thing. Awesome. I do have to run, Ricardo. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much to, for joining. Yep. Yeah, feel free to reach out. Like I'm, I'm down to come talk to you again. Just let me know. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking time to to join us. Yeah. Thank Great you. chatting with you all. Cool. So I don't know if anyone had additional questions. Kind of. Uh, this was a late, uh, late call for for, for the subject. Anyone has anything to raise or even other topics? Uh, Alex, I saw you unmuting. I was just trying to think of what else we, how else I think about it from the standpoint of this, you know, we're an air gapped company and I run an open source team and there's inherent tension there. Um, and I don't know whether it's worth just trying to think about that tension and uh, whether there's any discussion to, to be had around it. Um, but it's not a well-formed thought, so I put myself back on mute <laughs> until, until I thought about it. So um, I don't know. Uh, I drove a bunch of questions there. Has anybody else got questions around this ergat world? Uh, not really any questions, just kind of here to kind of see what whether what others are kind of up to in that space. Uh, where I come from, uh, you know, we do some kind of different kinds of uh, national security work. So uh, we have several different types of networks that are, you know, secluded and uh, within those networks, uh, you know, they, they, they might be running Kubernetes. And so uh, trying to figure out uh, different combinations of tools and how to how to securely scan artifacts or create new artifacts that can be consumed um, all outside of that protected space and then pull those in um, so that they can be deployed uh, in a production uh, or even a development environment for that matter. So um, yeah, um, we we leverage GitLab quite a bit for for a lot of those kinds of things um, just from an organization model. Uh, perspective, we use the you know the runners and the way that that they're designed. We can be a little bit flexible about that, um, but we <laughs> it depends on what environment we're talking about because sometimes it, it's kind of hard to uh, avoid the, the transfer of certain kinds of files uh, without walking them over and physically applying them to said cluster space. So <laughs> it's um it's, it's interesting. Um, anyhow. Um, yeah, so I'm just kind of here to kind of learn and, and, uh, listen. And so, yeah, no specific questions though. Yeah, 
think I think for our uh, environment as well. Like we also have uh, GitLab and we explore a lot the uh, the runners. But uh, what we've been trying uh, as much as possible now is to have this model that uh, also Jeffrey is dis describing, which is to have one single source of truth for all the packages, images, and have that really tight and then define policies on how things should be mirrored or replicated to different environments. And uh, yeah, those those will be, uh, those replicas will be air gapped and, and read only. Uh, and they have to be populated via the central one where we enforce the policies. This is basically what we've been trying to achieve. The challenges are really on making this as seamless as possible for everyone. We actually do the same for uh, external packages. Um, I don't know, like Jeffrey mentioned briefly, this idea of having kind of pull through uh, caches in uh, in the repositories. We, we do that as well. We we try to enforce um, even on our general uh, networks that uh, nothing is pulled directly from whatever. It, it's all coming through our single source of truth, even if that means. Uh, Pulling through and and then just making them available after the the checks. Yeah, we we do the same thing where we use policies to drive. Okay, where where is that single source of truth that we're allowed to pull from, uh, in order to really con tightly control, um, you know, even people within that space trying to, um, you know, do custom things or try things out directly. You know where are they allowed to pull those resources from? So we we control that via policy. So I think Alex asked uh, before about the actual tools being used. And maybe like for for us, we use uh, specifically for container images. We are relying on Harbor, and we run the CVE vulnerability scanners plus uh, some additional checks uh, that we have uh, in addition to like whatever goes in the, in the code themselves, in the GitLab repos. Um, what are people using for this? Um, well, since I was already, I was already talking and I'll, 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 I'll share. Um, uh, we're using uh, some of the Aquasec tooling out there to scan our repository images. And we're using GitLab uh, artifact repositories uh, to help deploy those, so, and scan, so. We're, I think we're using also like check marks and uh, app spider and a few other a few other things out there too uh, to kind of provide that reporting level and um, and kind of adhere to uh, to the the standards that we have to so yeah I feel like we were using Aquasec at one point I don't know if we're still we are. Um, I know Black Duck is something uh, on the inside as well. I, I sometimes don't see all of everything because I'm on the outside. Um, those are two that I know that we're employing, I assume X-Ray because we use Artifactory as well. Um, I just uh, signed this up for Tidelift. So there's some amount of that coming in. Um, you know, various things built into GitHub, I suppose. Um, yeah, there's probably a whole world that I don't even know about in terms of scanning that GB Search is doing. Uh, I could come back and, and give a full list at some point. Yeah, we are using also Aqua uh, things to, to do the vulnerability scans as well. Curious, Ala, uh, what are you uh, employing over in IBM? Oh, <laughs> what a timing. I was just about to drop off. Oh. Um, uh, so I, 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 uh, I have to, to admit that I'm in, uh, in IBM research, so I'm a little bit uh, removed from uh, production environment, uh, although I have been uh, you know, involved in uh, 
you know, uh, the development and, and, and you know, cont uh, you know, continuous integration and, and, and deployment of from, for some IBM services before, but not currently at, at the moment. But it's, uh, so, uh, you know, just a few comments on some of the little, some of the things that were mentioned. So I was really uh, surprised when I heard, you know, someone said that, like, open source, or gap even in their uh, own uh, environment, right? Uh, that's uh, that. I uh, actually we don't have that, right? For open source, uh, uh, people contributing to open source typically are able to, um, you know, uh, download and experiment and so on in 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 their own environments, right? That these are things not going to production, right? But they are able to do that freely. Um, uh, so we, we deploy, of course, DevSecOps uh, pipelines and a variety of, uh, of scan, image scanning uh, tools. Uh, uh, different, um, different organizations or different business units really uh, um, are using um, different pipelines, actually. So there are some efforts, of course, to unify those things. But you can, as you can imagine, you know, IBM is very big, many, many units, right, doing different things. So um, I, I don't see, you know, one unified uh, DevSecOps uh, pipeline with, with, with fixed uh, set of tools that are forced uh, on everyone. Certainly in, 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 in research, we have flexibility in that. Um, uh, so uh, in terms of, uh, so we use, of course, IBM Cloud Registry, we use Quay, we use uh, uh, Artifactory. Uh, these are some of the, uh, you know, repos that, uh, of course, uh, we use, plus GitHub, of course. <laughs> and we have our internal IBM GitHub. And that's that's the other, that's the, 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 the other thing, of course, that, um, for some of um, for some of our projects, we have only um, uh, inner source. So we replicate like the the, the GitHub.com model in in, in GitHub.ibm.com, and um, basically we have projects that people can contribute to. We call it inner source, right? Following the same open source model. Cool. cool. Sorry that I. Uh... I stopped you from from he uh, heading out. <laughs> no. I had yes, I, <laughs> I I I needed to head out, but but since you you pinged me, I thought you know I will just uh, give a few comments. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, but but thank you thank you all for the discussion. Really. All right. I think th this is probably just uh, like uh, it feels a bit like. Uh, we, we can learn a lot still on, on this kind of thing, uh, but it's also a very broad topic. So maybe maybe it's something we want to bring again uh, later in the year, I guess. Uh, it seems like there's interest. Um, yeah, I feel like it's a pity that, that Jamie wasn't able to join. He could have given a lot more flavor from our side about trials and tribulations of working on the inside of the air gapped uh, yeah. solution to research. Uh, I am on the open source side, so I'm, I'm, I'm on the other side of it, mostly. Um, All right, it's all good. Uh, you can bring it back. Um, but okay, so I think uh, we, we still had quite a nice, uh, nice overview of uh, options and problems. So if no one else has uh, things to raise on this topic, I think... Uh, what, what I would, so I'm just looking at the agenda for the next one, and we have cluster API and cross plane. So mm -hmm. I think that will be a very interesting one as well. Uh, so that will be in two weeks, March 16th. Um, I, I'm just thinking if we should cover both in the same section, a session, or or if it's even worth to split because they are not really the same. Like cross plane is more a uh, generic. Uh, way to integrate external resources while cluster API is really focusing on one one use case. Mm -hmm. So maybe we choose one, which one would people prefer? I feel like I'm more interested in cross-plane. 
Crossplane. But I am but one vote. <laughs> um, I I don't have a, a personal preference, so I will I will jump on the bandwagon there. So I, I, I would vote for that. There's two now. Awesome. Yes. All right. So we have Jonathan and Nathan to to break the. Yeah, I think it's settled. I think it's it's all cross plane all the time now. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Let's do cross plane though. I, I, that's an easy one to reach out. I know the people well, so that will be easy. Um, and then should we go? Uh, maybe we keep cluster API in the backlog then, uh, just so that we don't forget that we had it there. I'll just add it here. <laughs> Nathan, you, you just can't take a firm stance on this one. Uh, um, what was I going to say? Oh, um, I'm staying with this. Uh, Jonathan also voted for this point. I didn't see it in the chat. So. Um, I, I need to get the, uh, you know, we started putting this batch working group together for the CNCF and um, uh, I hasn't been haven't been many respondents for the doodle uh, to try and figure out when a uh, uh, when we should have a meeting. Um, if any of you are interested in this topic, uh, mm -hmm. here is the doodle. Um, so this this was sort of born out of a discussion around um, Allah, who was on here, has a project MCAD, and we have a project in Armada. Klaus Ma has a, a project Volcano, and um, there's a whole bunch of work around batch scheduling. Um, and in one of the tag sessions, we thought that it might be useful to have a, a focused working group on just that as part of the CNCF. There is one already happening as part of Kubernetes, which met last week. That was the discussion last week. We have one going for the CNCF uh, in general. If uh, any of you are interested in that kind of a discussion, there's a doodle here so that we can try and figure out when would be a good time to, to meet. So just making a plug for that. Yeah, maybe I'll like send an email to the list as well, and maybe push it on the Slack channel as well, the Doodle, so that because uh, here we are only five right now. Yeah, uh, this is yeah. my first step towards getting some traction here. So, yes, yeah, I will do. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, also I, I just posted also the link to the colloquial event for um, yeah. Yeah, Jonathan, that is the case, yeah. It's the, I think it's called Batch System Initiative within the CNCF, and it will be under the tag runtime. Nice. And and then I, I just posted the link for the, this collocated event at KubeCon in Valencia in May. So uh, the CFP is still open until, uh, I think, uh, Monday next week. Midnight BST, so basically Tuesday for all of us. Um, I also post the link directly. So feel free to submit a proposal, um, including things like the batch system initiative. It's probably worth uh, talking about it um, in, in this event. There will be uh, uh, talks about uh, the Kubernetes batch working group and uh, the proposal for Q that, uh, that, um, that um, we, we saw in the last meeting. Um, so there will be a lot of um, talks in this area for HPC and batch and workflows and queues and stuff like this. So yeah, make sure you push uh, all the proposals you have. Uh, we'll definitely have a good event. It will be a half day with a networking uh, dinner after. Yeah, uh, I hope to get out to that. Um, I think Ricardo, the other Ricardo, uh, signed me up to speak something at some point. I don't know. <laughs> so we'll see. I think that's for the CNCF background time, though. 
You mean a Varena? Yeah. We can go Varena. Yeah. So that's that's at the CNCF tag runtime, but this this is the collocated event that could come. So yeah, make sure you no, that's submit. It was yeah, it was something to do with KubeCon that he signed me up for. I, I have yet to figure out what what he did. Ah, okay, then I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. sounds good. Yep. All uh, right. Cool. Okay, so I think that's it for today. So thanks a lot, everyone, and meet you in two weeks for crossplane. Perfect. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. See you.